Hello, I'm John Adams. Today I'm with the Reverend Prebrandry Simon Cordell of the Bridge North and Morville Tea Ministry. So hi Simon, thank you for coming in today. My first question to you then, there is a perception that the vicar's main role is standing at the front of the church and leading the funeral service. Um, what other roles and responsibilities do you have when carrying out a funeral service um, for someone who's passed away? I mean, the moment where you see um, a member of the clergy in the church, uh, fully robed or, or whatever vestments they're going to be wearing at the time, which will be something that's part of the conversation with the family, um, uh, that's the specific sort of public bit. First of all, we get the call uh, from the funeral director who will work with us then to find an appropriate date and time. And then we'll arrange as soon as possible to see the family and just to talk them through what they are looking for in terms of the service that we're going to be providing for them. You get families that we know that are uh, members of the church uh, or perhaps the deceased was a member of the church uh, where we know really quite well what's likely to be the case. Um, we get people who perhaps we've known less well uh, or not at all. Uh, where we need to work through very carefully with the family to make sure that the funeral is appropriate both for the deceased and for the family who are grieving at that time. And what we're trying to do is uh, arrange a moment in time that is enabling us to celebrate a life because that's a huge part of what a funeral is. Uh, it is a proper celebration and we're enabling the family to grieve. This is a family who have encountered a loss, somebody who was a big part of their lives, who they were, um, who they are, uh, is now no longer with them and that's going to be with them for the rest of their lives. And this is part of a process that's going to enable them to, to begin to come to terms with that. Uh, thanks, thanks, Simon. And you mentioned there that there's some families that you won't know. Yeah. Uh, lots of families that you do know. So in this area, do you what do you see? Do you because obviously historically the Church of England's had those deep roots within the community. Yeah. Is that still there in this area? Do you think? I think it's there residually, um, perhaps less than it was, uh, but in particularly market towns and, and even more so in village areas, uh, you will find that the church is still quite substantially uh, a part of the community. I mean, it's interesting to see, for example, around some of our services at, at say, you know, Christmas and, and, and so on, um, this year perhaps aside, but um, you sometimes in a parish have anything up to, you know, a third to a half of the community. Uh, will actually be attending church over Christmas. Um, here uh, in uh, the town, in Bridge North, uh, it'll be rather less than that, but nonetheless, you will have uh, a huge part of the, uh, of, of the population will engage in some way, shape or form with the church during the course of the year. And they'll have their own reasons why they do that, but nonetheless, that is a contact point for us. We are known and that gives us a great advantage at times when people are looking for reassurance when they're faced by the strange circumstances of, of death and are perhaps a little bit at sea because of, of what is a very permanent change to their own lives. And back to the funeral service then, that yeah. public side of, of a funeral um, and, what, and your role there, obviously this, this year has been strange with COVID and Absolutely. all the restrictions in place, but pre-COVID, and, uh, and overall, do you think that funeral services within the church are changing? Um, yes, unquestionably they are and they have done uh, over the last 20 plus years that, that, that I've been ministering in this area. We've seen uh, us moving from a, a, a point where a traditional service uh, was what people would go for in terms of, you know, they probably have two or three hymns which they know for themselves. They expect a particular style and, 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 and format. Whereas actually, even then, 20 years ago, the funeral service was and is now a very flexible beast. We're more now 
having things like pieces of music being played uh, as meditations that enable us to remember the life and times of the deceased well, or particular reflective passages of, of, of poems or writings that enable us to remember the person and indeed help us to reflect perhaps to what we hope and pray they are going on to. We're seeing much more bespoke funerals and uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, more personal for that family. Yeah, absolutely. Which enables them to move forward yes. with their grief and bereavement. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, I, I think there was a time when uh, the perception perhaps was that we were quite rigid in what we did. It had to be done this way. Yeah. Um, and that really isn't the case. It wasn't then actually, but but much more the case it isn't now. Yeah. With that as well, that with that rigid format as well, there, has a, there is a perception that perhaps the church is like that. Um, that brings me on to my next question about civil funerals and non-religious funerals, mm -hmm. and now having no funeral service at all. Um, so just for, for those who are watching who aren't aware, so civil funerals are where it's led by a, a celebrant um, who can actually incorporate religion into the funeral service. Whereas a humanist funeral, which is a completely non-religious service, and obviously now we had direct cremations and unattended funeral service, where a coffin is taken to a crematorium and no service even takes place, the family aren't present. Um, I've got some information here actually, which we have spoken about before. So in 2008, the Church of England carried out uh, in the United Kingdom 180,000 funerals. Um, 10 years later, 2018, uh, they carried out around 125,000. So there's been a drop over, t over 10 years, quite a, quite a big drop. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Why is that happening? Uh, and is there anything the church can do to, to sort of to combat that effectively? Well, firstly, I think that we need to, and I think we are, uh, combat the notion that, that somehow we are very fixed and rigid in, in what we're offering. Going back 10 or 20 years, uh, certainly the older generation who were passing away at that time were by nature and inclination um, more accustomed to being, as you might call it, religious. That is less so today. And you see that actually in census surveys and so on, where people say, what is your, the question is, what's your religious affiliation? Um, and that is falling. So it shouldn't be a surprise to us that people turn to the church less uh, at times of grief and stress and hardship. But I think what I'd also say at that point is that whatever you're doing, uh, a funeral service needs to be this moment that does a number of things. As I said earlier, it needs to be capable of celebrating somebody's life. It needs to enable a family to grieve, but also it needs to be able to enable a family to look at the that which they are ushering the person into. Uh, you were, we were born, we came into the world uh, and we had nothing. We leave the world and we have nothing. And yet, from the church's perspective, you know, that is God yep. in, in both of those things. And, and so a funeral service in church is about commending a person to God. Um, and it's also then about the nuts and bolts, obviously, uh, of just committing a body to whatever means of, of appropriate disposal need to take place, so cremation or burial. Um, now, some of those uh, possibilities that you, you outline there, that's direct cremation, which is actually just about a committal. It is just about the disposal of the body. Um, doesn't, simply doesn't do a, a, a number of those other things uh, unless you arrange them separately and outside of the funeral and, and and I think that's a problem because any psychologist will tell you that that grieving is a real human process that needs to be undergone in some way and what we in the Church of England can do uh, within the context of our um, core beliefs in, 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 in the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, enable people to come to terms with their loss, 
and give them a framework for that and also uh, enable us to be able to commend that person uh, to God in a way that is releasing. Um, sometimes around the ministry that is to the dying, sometimes I've had the immense privilege of being around um, a, a, a bedside well, when someone is in the extremism. Perhaps they're conscious, perhaps they're not, um, and the family will be with them, uh, and I will pray with them. Um, if it's appropriate and they're conscious they want to, then I might give them communion. Um, uh, and one of the things that I will say to the family, having talked it through with them, is have you actually had the chance to say goodbye? Have you had the chance to, to let go um, in a way that is releasing both to the per person who is dying and uh, actually releasing to you as well? On occasions, um, early in my ministry, I was a, a voluntary hospice chaplain uh, and I'd sometimes be called into hospice um, where a family had been round at somebody's bedside for sometimes days um, in imminent expect expectation of their death. And the question that I'd often ask at that point would be, have you, have you actually said goodbye to them? Have you said, it's all right, you can go now? Yeah. Yeah. And, and often when I needed to ask that question, the answer was no. And when they did, and I quietly step out of the room and they did what they needed to do, they said their goodbyes and so on. It was extraordinary because quite frequently I'd get a call a bit later, sometimes within the hour, to say actually they've just part of peace, peacefully slipped away. And that can also be healing on both sides almost. Hugely healing on both sides. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's about, you know, saying, you know, in the intimacy of a family, you know, mum, dad, we love you, it's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. And that needs to be said, that's part of grieving. Yeah, talking, communication. Yeah. 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 No, thank you, Simon. So with the last um, seven to nine months of the COVID-19 um, situation, how the church, especially in this area, how have you evolved and how have you adapted yeah. to the restrictions and limitations? Yeah, it has been hard uh, because there is an element to which we have been constrained to styles of funerals that, that we wouldn't necessarily have wanted to give. In, to give you an example there, that there have been occasions where we know that the church would have been absolutely packed to the gunnels for particular individuals' funerals. And yet having to talk to the bereaved and say, look, you know, we're terribly sorry, but because of regulations, we can only have a maximum of 30 people or one time during the lockdown it was it was 10 um, and outside by the graveside um, at, was and is at times still quite difficult so we have to find other ways of enabling people to grieve and I know that you've been doing that as well in terms of making sure that routes for the funeral cortege are planned uh, in terms of having sometimes people outside the uh, church to clap them off down the street um, uh, and in terms of dealing with the families um, as well we've had a, a, a lot more that have been videoed um, I mean videos used to be uh, the, the, the exclusive preserve of weddings um, uh, given that we are, can't have weddings at the moment they now seem to be the exclusive preserve of funerals yeah. um, uh, and and that's actually really really helpful and in terms of dealing with the family, uh, obviously each individual family is, uh, is something that, that, that we encounter on a case-by-case -case basis because there will be some who are clinically vulnerable uh, and it's not appropriate really to be coming to see them face to face uh, and um, we have to be careful about that. But we still, where possible, uh, will seek to engage with people on a, 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 a personal and physical level because there's a degree of intimacy about a funeral 
and about how we plan it um, that is difficult to manage in any other way. I mean, it can be done, of course it can. Um, uh, but in terms of our care for people, we will want to work with them in order to make sure that the funeral is uh, going to be the, absolutely right for them, uh, but in the most personal way that we possibly can. You know, we're dealing with people who are individuals at this particular point who most frequently are, are hurting and sometimes hurting very, very deeply. Um, now I'll say from our experience, um, I know what you've been doing over the last seven or eight months, you and the team at Bridge North, yeah. Um, and even an example of a particular area in Bridge North where they suffered a very uh, sudden death uh, in very unnatural circumstances. And I know that you personally went down to that area yeah. um, prior to the funeral service to make sure and just to provide reassurance and prayers. And yeah. I know in that particular area it was very much appreciated. So yeah. just, yeah, on, on behalf of us here, thank you for what you're doing. It's been, uh, awesome. it's been massive for the community. Sure. So thank you. It, you know, oddly, oddly, to say around funerals, it is it is a pleasure um, in the sense that there aren't many people who have the the utter privilege of being able to step into the lives of others when they have a real point of need, and um, it's one of the immense joys of the of the of the role that even though funerals are a sad thing, we might actually be in a place where we're able to. Um, be of assistance and point people towards hope. So we've discussed the, the role um, of a vicar when it comes to funeral services, yeah. um, how you've evolved during COVID, um, but after a funeral service, hmm. do you just go away? Is that, is that the end of your role as a vicar? No, um, we have a profound sense of care for the families that we engage with over a funeral. It's not just a sort of, you know, drag and drop as it were. Um, and so after a funeral, what happens is that certainly in this parish and, and, and many that I know that we have a uh, post-funeral care team um, and the bereavement support group will contact families uh, usually about three weeks to a month after the funeral uh, first with a with a letter just giving people a heads up that somebody's going to be calling them it may well be the clergy it may well be a, a trained member of the team uh, we'll just phone them up and, and, and ask how they're getting on um, and offer to meet with them if there are things that they want to talk through uh, and then that relationship is one that goes on um, in as much as the chief mourner uh, wants it to so we don't force ourselves on on people who are actually dealing with this sadly but fine but if somebody wants some help um, with talking things through then that then we will do that um, equally where somebody is uh, clearly having severe problems with bereavement we have a range of, of that there are a range of counseling services you have bereavement counselor here um, and, uh, and we work with you to, to, to help people through that. The other thing that we do uh, is that, um, COVID aside, every six months we have a service in church that we positively invite families to that we have, where we've had uh, bereavements um, that we've been associated with, um, either as, as, as next door kin in the parish or um, uh, immediate relatives uh, and uh, we will write to them, invite them to this particular service where we will actually remember by name those who have died and are being remembered in the parish for the last six months. And that happens uh, usually in about uh, November around Remembrance Tide um, and uh, just after Easter in the Easter season where focus is even more about the, our hope in resurrection. Um, and those are the things that we have. And of course, we make it clear that at any time um, people are able to contact us if they wish to and uh, we can work through with them how they are. That's brilliant. Again, I think it shows a strength for the church and it's not just there for the funeral service. Yeah. It's about uh, being, being there throughout life, isn't it? So, um, yeah. So yeah, thank you, Simon. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and thank you for today. It's been a really interesting insight for people to, to see what you do, what the church does and how they're involved when someone passes away. So thank you for your time. Oh, it's a pleasure. Pleasure. Lovely to be here.